Professor Bashir discusses the U.S. Supreme Court decision expanding protections for transgender and gay workers. This is the Legal Impact presented by the University of New Hampshire Franklin Pierce School of Law. Now accepting applications for JD graduate programs and online professional certificates. Learn more and apply at law.unh.edu. Opinions discussed are solely the opinion of the faculty or host who do not constitute legal advice or necessarily represent the official views of the University of New Hampshire. So, Buzz, what are the cases that were decided on this week on this issue? The case was uh, Bostock versus Clayton County, Georgia. Uh, it was a lawsuit filed by three individuals because in one way or another, they were uh, discriminated against uh, by their employer. The basic provi- legal uh, provision that was at stake was Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Uh, let me read what Title VII says. It says this, basically. It makes it unlawful for an employer to fail or refuse to hire or to just discharge or otherwise discriminate against any individual because of such individual's sex. That's what the statute says. You can't fire someone because of uh, their sex. Um, So that's the law. The the cases, Bostick himself, uh, was gay, and he worked for the county, uh, Clayton County, and he he joined a gay softball league, and he was fired because he was determined to be gay. The second person, whose name I can't remember, uh, mentioned in a conversation that he was gay, and he was thereby fired. The third person uh, worked uh, a woman worked for a funeral home and came out and said, from now on, uh, she's a trans, she was a trans woman, was a trans woman, she's now deceased. She came out and said, from now on, I am for all purposes a woman and ask that you recognize that. And she was fired because of that. So all three of them in different ways were fired because of their sexual identity. The question before the court was, does that language cover it or not? Now, one court, the appellate court system within which Georgia is, the 11th Circuit, found that Bostock could be fired, and it didn't violate Title VII. The the circuit uh, the circuit court of appeals in two other jurisdictions, uh, the two other cases, uh, found that uh, it was a Title VII violation, and that's how the case got up to the U.S. Supreme Court. It's a, a classic example of why cases get taken by the U.S. Supreme Court when there's a split in the lower circuit courts of appeal, um, and so that's why uh, the case was up there. And it was a six to three decision saying the firing of those three people, each of them was a Title VII violation. They were fired because of their sex. Now, the three in the minority, uh, well... Yeah. I mean, can we, we'll we'll get to that because that's definitely fascinating with regards to this case especially, but how does the ruling protect workers going forward? It protects everyone from being fired because of their sexual identity. That is, if you identify as... So strictly across the board, the sexual identity, including their, but also how they consider themselves from a gender perspective, too. Correct. One of the, uh, Amy Stevens uh, was a trans woman. Um, She identified as a woman, putting aside her, you know, uh, biological uh, status at birth. It covers transgender people. Sex the, lang- the word sex covers any sexual identity. Effectively, when you read the majority opinion, that's very clear. And it was, to be honest, it was quite a surprise to many LGBTQ advocates around the country. There was a, a deep, deep concern that the four more moderate or more liberal judges, depending on how you view it, were going to be outvoted by the five uh, conservatives on the court. Uh, That turned out uh, not to be the case. Not only did uh, Chief Justice Roberts, who in some people's minds was the most likely one to side with the the four moderates on the court, uh, but also uh, Justice Gorsuch, sided with uh, the moderates on the court. And he, in fact, wrote the majority opinion in the case. So it was the outcome in terms of 
two from the conservative wing voting with the moderates slash liberals uh, was a surprise to many. There was not there was not despair, but there was not a great deal of hope for the outcome that that turned out. Now, does this specifically just in hiring situations with regards to the Civil Rights Act of 64 change the definition of what sex means, or does this have larger ramifications? No. What's interesting about the case, uh, let me frame the case. This isn't a case about the U.S. Constitution and discrimination under the U.S. Constitution. It's not a constitutional case. It's about, what does that word mean in the statute? Very often in the constitutional parsing of words, what does a word mean that's in the Constitution, you get into this very fraught discussion about originalism. What did the people who wrote the word mean when they wrote it back in 1792 or back in 1865 or 1866? or in 2018? What did they mean when they were writing it? And that's a way to look for meaning with a word that's otherwise vague. What was so interesting, but that's not the circumstance here. What was so interesting about what the court said is they rejected, by and large, that whole debate and said, there's no ambiguity about what the word sex means. It doesn't matter what it meant to the people who wrote the law back then. You only look at legislative intent if there is uh, ambiguity about what the word sex means. And the court was very clear in saying, no ambiguity here. It includes all sorts of sexual identity. You know, they were, all those people were, all three of those people were fired because of their sex. And I'm assuming the dissenting opinion disagrees with you on that. Yeah, there are two dissenting opinions, uh, one by uh, Justice Kavanaugh and uh, the other by just joined together Justice Thomas and Justice Alito. And they delve deeply into the meaning of words and originalism and textualism and interpretive, you know, interpretive jurisprudence for words. Uh, but they tried to import a lot of the constitutional conversation into understanding the statute. But the majority would have none of that. It was very interesting. It's a different form of textualism. It basically says, well, the statute says sex. They must mean sex. Now, how would that be different? I mean, are there other decisions to kind of see? I'm, I'm a little apprehensive of the fact that how is this different from a, a constitutional decision? It's not the Constitution. And, so because and, of, it's a statute, they, they're given more leeway to, to interpret. I put it differently. Um, yeah. you know, the, the words where they go about doing that in the Constitution or the phrases or the clauses, they go about doing that in the Constitution. Uh, they are there is uncertainty about what they mean. So let me give you an example. The Confrontation Clause in the Sixth Amendment says, everyone shall have the right to confront the witnesses uh, against them. Okay? Seems, uh, if, that, if that phrase is interpreted as in theory it means, then you would never allow hearsay uh, in a criminal case. Because the person who said the out-of-court thing, if they weren't in court, they couldn't be confronted by the person against whom the statement's being offered. The courts never interpreted the statute to mean that. They've understood, uh, there's some additional words, they've understood that to not mean that. You know, you can't, so uh, constitutional interpretation is different than statutory interpretation. And statutory interpretation plays very much off of you take the plain meaning of a word as it's written, and you assume that the legislature intended the word to mean what its plain meaning is. Uh, only when you start to get uh, statutes that use the word unreasonable or you know, something like that, like, or does this person have a duty of care, you know, uh, or the word privacy uh, in a statute, uh, 
pri where privacy does not appear in the uh, U.S. Constitution. But privacy, in a, the word privacy in a statute, uh, or unreasonable, or duty of care, you know, those, it, it's on their face, it's a little unclear, more than a little unclear what the word unreasonable means. So you get that, then you look at the legislative intent when that's going on. Uh, but uh, that's that was not the case. That the majority opinion said unambiguously that's not the case here. What sort of leeway do you predictably give to religious organizations or companies like that? Like Hobby Lobby, for example, is something in the past. It's it's not directly this, but there was there was religious leeway given on the decision. An obvious example with this specifically would be like a religious school uh, with an individual teaching ethics based curriculum or something like that. Do you predict there to be cases or decisions going? forward to kind of narrow down what exactly this protects? Uh, I think there'll continue to be challenges from the religious right uh, in terms of what uh, they mean under Title VII, what religious liberty means under Title VII. I really don't have any prediction. It's not an area of my specialty, so um, I try and uh, shy away from predictions and things that I don't know much about, although it makes it easier to predict. I think that litigation is going to go on and on. I know the religious right and the conservative movement uh, is all a flutter about uh, Justice, the Chief Justice uh, Roberts and Justice Gorsuch abandoning them. Uh, one one uh, one conservative commentator dramatically overstated uh, the effect of this opinion, uh, the Bostic opinion, by saying the conservative legal movement is over. So the sky, once again, the sky is falling, um, but things will Typical settle. Typical twenty twenty politics. <laughs> right. Things will settle down, and uh, we'll see how these things play out going forward. Thanks for listening to The Legal Impact, presented by UNH Franklin Pierce School of Law. To help spread word about the show, please be sure to subscribe and comment on your favorite podcast platform, including Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify.